In the second reading of Parshas Tetzave, we learn about the breastplate, the Choshen, or as it's known, the Choshen Mishpat. Initially, we talk about the onyx stones, and we talk about the straps that are that extend from the ephod, from the backwards apron. And then afterwards, we begin to focus on the breastplate. This is to be worn on the Kohen Gadol's chest. Aharon merits this garment as the first Kohen Gadol because he rejoiced in his heart, and the, and the Choshen is on the heart. And that's when Moshe Rabbeinu was elevated above him to become the leader of the Jewish people, and although Aaron first had a go at it, and he was not successful, nonetheless, Aaron had that room in his heart for his brother, his younger brother's rise. And the Choshen Mishpat, as it's called Mishpat, atones for the miscarriages of justice. Also, it's going to be explained that when there is a specially made parchment inserted in it, then it becomes an oracle or a communications device. At any rate, from Pasuk Tesvav, or 15 onward, we hear about the Choshen. We have a commandment, via Sisa, Choshen Mishpat, you'll make a Choshen of judgment. And we hear about how it has to be made, Maisa Choshev, it has to be made of a woven design. And the Torah talks to us about the details of the, the ingredients, what will be used. And then afterwards we hear about the size. And then we hear about precious gemstones. We have four rows of rectangular shaped gems, maybe rectangular, I'm not so sure about that. That's how it's depicted. And at any rate, we hear about the details of these special gemstones that represent the entirety of the tribes of Israel. And towards the end of the reading, after having completed the description of the breastplate in verse 28, and telling us that it must always remain in its proper place. The Torah then speaks about the function of the Choshen Mishpat in verse 29. And the Torah says that the, that the Nosar and Eshmeiz Bnei Yisrael, that by wearing the breastplate and its engraved stones, Aaron is thusly carrying the names of Israel's sons. In the Choshen Mishpat, in the breastplate of judgment over his heart, Ali Bai, the Voy Allah Kaidish, when he comes into the tabernacle, and that serves, Lizikorin, it serves as a constant remembrance, Lefne Hashem Tamit, before God. So, in other words, after hearing about how to make the Choshen Mishpat and the details of what was used, all of the different materials that were necessary to fashion the Choshen Mishpat, the Torah then turns its attention to the function of the Choshen Mishpat. What's the purpose? The purpose is a reminder. Whenever Aaron will go into the Holy, or the Holy of Holies, into the Kodesh or Kodesh HaKadoshim, he's always going to be wearing the Choshen Mishpat. And in this way, he will carry the names of the different tribes of Israel, remembering at all times that he represents not himself, his family, or his tribe, but ultimately all of Bnei Yisrael. Then in verse 30, the Torah changes its direction. And the Torah tells us about what you should place inside the folds of the Choshen. So the Choshen was a long rectangular, rectangular piece of cloth, but was folded in half to, to make a square. In verse 30, the Nasata el Choshen ha Mishpat, you'll place into the folds of that breastplate of judgment, es ha-urim v'yes ha-tumim, the urim and tumim. By the way, Yale, Yale University, I think, or Harvard, till today, their, their official emblem, <coughs> it says Urim and Tumim. And they say that's because there was a rabbi, a Spanish rabbi, who spent time in, in the United States. And he was the rabbi of the Rhodes Synagogue for a little while. And the pan who later became the president of the university, I think it was Harvard, was a person who spent time with this rabbi. <laughs> and he learned Hebrew from him and all kinds of other things. At any rate, the Urim and Tumim are placed into the folds of the adjustment. And we'll soon see what, that, what does that mean, Urim and Tumim. There's different opinions as to what it means. Vahoyu aleivaharen. So the first thing is, we have a verb, we have a, a command. Vinasata, you will place into the Chosha Mishpat. What will we place in the Chosha Mishpat? The Urim and the Tumim. Okay. 
The next part of the verse is, The next part of the verse sounds relatively redundant. It will be on the heart of Aaron when he comes before God. The Torah then says, not only will it be on the heart of Aaron, but Venosa Aharon is Mishpat Bnei Yisrael Alibay. Aharon is going to carry the judgment of the Jewish people on his heart. Lefnei Hashem Tamid, before God at all times, constantly. This is a very strange verse. Because the verse begins by telling us something new and different, and it reverts back to the same old. It starts off by telling us about what we're going to place into the Choshem Mishpat. You'll place in a Urim and a Tumim, and we don't even know what that means because these words don't show up in Hebrew. Urim and Tumim show up once with regard to this. They're not used elsewhere. You'll place into Mishpat Urim and Tumim. And then it says, going right back to exactly what we said in verse 29, that this will be on the heart of Aaron, and he will carry on the heart of Aaron for the Mishpat Bnei Yisrael to atone for the miscarriage of justice. But this has already been, all already been said. So... It begins with the business of placing the Urim and Tumim, and then it goes back to the discussion of the Choshen and how it will be on Aaron's heart, and how by doing so, there will be a constant remembrance of the children of Israel. So Rashi says, Esa Urim ve'esa Tumim. He says, this means, this means, because it says you place Urim and Tumim into the Choshen, that means that the Choshen is in and of itself not Urim or Tumim. Because you're placing Urim and Tumim inside it. Now, I should tell you, there are Rishonim who hold that the Urim and Tumim is another name for the Choshen itself. But clearly Rashi doesn't follow that approach. And I think the reason Rashi doesn't follow that approach is because it says, Venosata, mm-hmm. you should place El Choshen Mishpat, into the Choshen Mishpat, you should place Urim and Tumim. So how could Choshen Mishpat be Urim and Tumim if you're placing it into the Chosh Mishpat. But don't speak so, so quickly. You'll see. It's not so simple. What distinguishes Urim and Tumim, though? Good question. Let's see what Rashi says. Okay. First, what is it? The first thing we got to know. What is it? What is Urim and Tumim? So Rashi says, Hu Ksav Shem HaMaforish. This is a parchment upon which is written the ineffable name of God. The explicit ineffable name of God. And Rashi says, Shahoya Nosno Betoch Kifle HaChoshen. It was placed into the folds of the Choshen. Remember, the Choshen is a piece of rectangular cloth. So when you fold a rectangle in half, you get a square. So in that fold was placed a parchment. And on that parchment is written the explicit and ineffable name of God, Shem HaMaforish. It's inside the parchment. Is it one piece? Both are together? Urim and Tum. It sounds like one thing. The question, of course is what is this? Why is it called Urim and Tumim? So the Ramban says that this was a mystery, a secret, a sod that was given to Moshe Rabbeinu from God and Har Sinai, and he wrote it in resplendent holiness, and he placed it inside, and nobody knew how to write something like this. It was one parchment of history. One ever, written by Moshe Rabbeinu, with the secrets that he learned from God and Har Sinai, never communicated it with anybody, and that was placed inside the folds of the Choshen. So what, is, what does it do? Why is it called Urim Vitumim? So Rashi says something very interesting. So, so it's not an individualized parchment for each Shara? For, so no. Like 12 of them? No, Just there aren't 12 them? parchments. There's one parchment. There's one parchment. One parchment. It's called Urim Vitumim. It's called Urim Vitumim. It's placed in the folds of the Choshen. Not the... the, the not the gemstones. the gemstones. The gemstones are not called Urim Vitumim. According to Rashi, the, the Urim Vitumim is the name of the parchment. So why is it called Urim and Tumim? First of all, why does it have two names? Is it Urim or is it Tumim? And secondly, why is it called Urim and Tumim? <laughs> why is it called the parchment? The scroll, the mezuzah. So Rashi says this. This scroll was able to activate the Choshen. Sha'al Yodo, it was by virtue of this, this parchment, who may ear the gemstones would light up. light up. How do you say light up in Hebrew? Uh, or is light. Laha'ir like la is to illuminate. And Meir is, they become radiant. They are radiant. So, Shahoyo Meir, that these gemstones would begin to radiate. They would light up. Umetamem es The word Tumim, he says, 
comes from the terminology of to complete, like the word tamim, which means complete. So it's mitamim, it completes its words or its things. And that is to say, we have a tradition which is discussed in detail in the Talmud that when the Jewish people needed to ask of Hashem direction, they would do so to the Kohen who was wearing the Urim Vetumim and the Kohen would be able to respond to them. This was essentially an incredible communications device through which they were literally speaking to God, getting direct communication from God Himself. So the Urim lights up the otiot, the letters of the Choshen, because those gemstones had letters engraved. They had the letters of the Shvatim. So the letters that were engraved would light up to spell out the answer. And in doing so, it would complete the words or the communication would be made. A full communication would be established. And the notion of full or completion is called Tamim. So it's called Urim and Tumim because it was through the parchment that you had Urim and Tumim come to the Choshen Mishpat, the otherwise lifeless, inanimate breastplate of judgment. But wouldn't the proper syntax be Ve'et Ha'urim Vitumim as opposed to Et Ha'tumim? Because that implies something separate, wouldn't it? So actually it does, it really seems like it's doing, it's doing two things. No, but it, it implies something, separate objects. That's, not, that's how it, do, it does imply separate objects. But really, as Rashi explains to us, it's not called Urim or Tumim because of its, the objective reality, but rather because of its function. What it, what it brings about. It brings about Urim and it brings about Tumim. It enables the breastplate to go live, meaning to light up, and it allows for a communication to be established, for lack of better terminology, for the electromagnet to be completed. A connection is, is, is achieved. So that's, that's Metamam. So there's actually two things going on here. It's lighting up, it's going live, and it's actually working. You're establishing that connection, that communication with God. Urim and Tumim. Not because of what it is, but because of what it's able to make happen. Through this, this is what's achieved. So what does it mean as Mishpat Bnei Yisrael? He says, you'll place the Urim and Tumim. Aaron will carry it in his heart. He'll carry es mishpat bnei Yisrael. He'll carry the, ca- the, the justice of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Says Rashi, Dovar shehem nishpatim v'noichachim al yodai im lasis dover oloi lasis. This is not a repetition of what we spoke of earlier. Earlier, we mentioned and talked about the idea that if there is a miscarriage of justice, which is a grave sin in Hashem's eyes, that the urim v'tumim or more accurately, the Choshen Mishpat would be able to atone for the miscarriage of justice. That's why it's called the Choshen Mishpat. There were different things in the base of Migdash that atoned for different realities. There was imperfections, inequities, shortcomings, and certain things in the Mishkan atoned for it. In fact, the daily offerings atoned for what? Or more accurately, our, our, our lost opportunities. Our mitzvahs asay. And even if we did the mitzvah say, the mitzvah say we didn't do fully. We didn't do with, with the investment of heart, mind, and soul, and passion. We weren't as meticulous as we should be, so, so we fell short. So this korban would kind of create a surge of energy that would kind of move things along. Whatever was missing, the korban would make up for. So the choshen mishpat would make up for a miscarriage of justice so its blight would not be left upon the Jewish people. That's how we explained the idea of the Choshen Mishpat before. But now Rashi is saying something else. He's saying it's through the Choshen that the Jewish people are judged. It doesn't mean really judged. But it's, 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 it's things, circumstances are clarified. We come to a, a judgment call or a, a, a decision. This is more like the idea of rendering decisions for the Jewish people. Should we go to war or not go to war? This is probably the most fateful decision any head of state can ever have to make. You're making a decision that will irreparably change lives. People's children will die. People will never be able to live out their lives. But if you don't go to war, when you must go to war, more innocent lives will be lost. Or perhaps another justification. And then history will not judge judge you kindly. To To have no courage, to have the temerity, to just have peace at any price, that's Chamberlain. That's not a good thing. To be an aggressive warmonger 
It's a terrible thing. So the most serious decision any head of state ever has to make, ever, this is, this is applicable everywhere, in every country, in every civilization, in every society. The most serious decision is ever going to war. How do they make those decisions? Today, they make those decisions. How do they make it then? They had God telling them what to do. They would come and say, Allah, I love you, Allah. Go up to war, don't go up to war. And the Kohen Gadol would look down at his communications device and it would illuminate, it would shine up, it would say, Cain or Lo. So even if you went to battle, and it was a disaster, you knew you're doing the right thing. Why? Because God said so. This is what you could call an oracle. It's, a, it's really a way for us to know exactly what does Hashem want or what Hashem doesn't want. And that's why it's called Mishpat. So the Mishpat, the mishpat means it clarifies, it decides, it helps us come to a resolution on whatever we might ask. Incidentally, the questions that we asked were not of per- personal concern. There were issues of national concern, like going to war, not going to war. Big decisions like that. So that's when we would ask the Urim Vatumim and find out what to do. And it was also not a way to resolve halachic disputes. There's a methodology for that. The Torah gives us a way to figure that out. According to the Medrash Agada, the idea of the Chesha Mishpat is Shah Mechapar al Ma'av Adin. Here Rashi adds that there is the Medrash Agada, which he doesn't bring in the first interpretation, it is that the Cheshen actually does atone for miscarriage of justice. And Nikra Mishpat, it's called judgment, al Shem Slichas Mishpat, because it atones for lack of judgment. It's called judgment, but actually is dealing with the lack thereof. Now why does Rashi have to say two things? I think that there's a, there's a, the notion of Mishpat here is unwieldy. If you wanted to say that that's how Jewish people reach decisions, justice is not the right word. It's like doing justice. It's not doing justice. It's, 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 it's coming to decisions. It's, it's getting clarity. There are words for that. It's not justice. Doing justice is a funny word. So why doesn't Rashi say to Medrash Agada that it comes to, be, to atone for a miscarriage of justice? Two reasons. Because we already heard about this before. And here, verse 30 starts off by telling us about the Urim and Tumim which illuminate and complete the connection. What does that have to do with the idea of miscarriage of justice? Number one. And number two, miscarriage of justice is not justice. It should be choshen ma'avse mishpat. The choshen that makes up, it doesn't make the judgment, it makes up for lack of judgment. But this is what the Torah gives us, what we have to go on. So therefore we have to invoke both interpretations and only by using both together can we come to some kind of understanding of why it would be called Choshem Mishpat as a result of multiple reasons, multiple ideas that are being conveyed. <coughs> Incidentally, the notion of that Aaron will have to carry the Mishpat Bnei Yisrael is also somewhat difficult to understand. According to the Sepharno, it indicates that Aaron would pray for Hashem's forgiveness for the Jewish people. Not that the Choshen would atone for justice. Aaron would pray for, ju- for, ju- for, the, for atonement for justice. At any rate, we now are going to take a deeper look into this and get to the bottom line of, was this a wardrobe accessory or a communications device? What's up with this? So there's a little piece of Rashi I left out. Now we're going to take a look and see the Rashi here as it's quoted by the Rebbe. In the beginning, the first, the first Rashi on verse 30, which talked to us about the idea of Urim Vetumim as illuminating and completing, Rashi adds another two sentences. Page Reish Nun Beis, Simen Yud Dalad. So, if you'll take a look in the bold print on top, the second part of the Rashi is Ube Migdash Sheni in the second base of Migdash Haya Hachayshen. There was a breastplate. Why? Shei Efsha Lekayin Gadol Lias Mechuser Begadim because a Kohen Gadol is not permitted to serve the base of Migdash if he doesn't have all the raiments. Avalaisi Hashem Lehaya. But that parchment wasn't there. There was a choshen. There was no order of a tomb inside it. No parchment. It was because of that parchment that was called mishpat. So really in the second base of Migdash, you could have called it a choshen, but at least according to the first interpretation of Rashi, you couldn't call it a choshen mishpat. Why could you call it a choshen mishpat? Because it didn't provide any mishpat. It didn't light up. It didn't light up. It didn't talk to us. 
we couldn't establish a connection. The cell tower was down. And that was the case? Huh? No Wi-Fi. No Wi-Fi. Do you know what the Wi-Fi was? The Wi-Fi was the, the Luchas. The Wi-Fi is the Kruven. That's, that's the actual Wi-Fi. This is the battery. No Wi-Fi, no battery. It didn't work. Aye, the Wi-Fi was there deep in the mountain. The urn is buried in the mountain, but there's no battery in the iPhone. No battery. It looks good. It's a nice accessory, but it couldn't be a communications device. The Rebbe says, pray tell, why is Rashi talking about this now? Is this a historical history lesson of the second base of Migdash? Lamaynafkemina in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu to talk about the second base of Migdash, whether they will have or won't have the battery that works, the parchment. What relevance is this? How does it explain the meaning of Chosha Mishpat any better? Whatever, the second base of Migdash, second base of Migdash. Rashi can comment in the Gemara and talk about the second base of Migdash. So, how did that work? They were missing a portion of, of what you need to have in the base of Migdash. And the answer is you're right. They were missing a portion of it. A lot of things are missing in the second base of Migdash. The Oren wasn't there. The Kruven weren't there. The Luchot weren't there. Had they come into the Holy of Holies? They came in. What was it? An empty room? Like, like why is Rashi telling us stories about the second base of Migdash now? This is, not, this is about understanding the verse. The verse is difficult to understand because it says Choshen and Mishpat. We don't know why it's called Mishpat. It says Urim and Tumim. We don't know why it's called. Is, what is it? Is it a Choshen, Mishpat, Urim, or Tumim? What is it? They got four names here. Make up your mind. So Rashi gives us an explanation. The Urim and Tumim is the Ksav. Why is the Ksav? Why is the parchment called the Urim and Tumim? Because it's Meir, Umetameim, the Choshen, Mishpat. It lights up the Choshen. It helps it go live. And it enables the communication to be achieved. Or God, it completes our electromagnet. So it's called Urim Vitumim. Now you know why it's called Urim Vitumim. Now you know why it's called Choshem Mishpat. And let's move on. That's just one second. Before we go, I just want you to know, in the second base of Megdash, they didn't have it. They didn't have it? There was no Choshem? No, no, no. There was a Choshem. You can't have a coin God without eight raiments. He has to have this wardrobe. But it was only an accessory. It looked good. But it didn't really work. Of what difference does this make? This is the, that, that, that sacred name that was written on the parchment. That was placed into the folds. And then it was through this that that the gemstones would light up and that the sentences would be completed. We'd ask the question and then get the answer. So it brings completion. According to this Eulah show, Urim Vetumim, Enim Davin Nifred Me'achoshem. So then the Urim Vetumim is not really separate from the Choshem. It's not called, that's called Urim and Tumim. It's the Urim and Tumim of the Choshem. The Choshem lit up. The Choshem was a communications device. Va'al Yodom, and it was through the parchment, or battery if you will, that Memale HaChoshem, that the Choshem was able to fulfill Tafkido, its purpose, Keroi, properly. So he said, If the Ur Vitumim is the completion of the Choshen, then there's something off with the order of the Psukim as they're presented to us. Because the second reading of Parshat Sava is primarily about the Choshen. And what happens here is that the, with the, the, the verses open with the Maise HaChoshen, with the making of the Choshen, it concludes with the commandment of what to do with the Choshen. Namely, that it should be fastened to the chest of Aaron. And the Torah says not only it should be fastened, but let it never depart from Aaron's chest. It has to be fastened in a way that it doesn't bang around and doesn't move away. And then only after this, then the Torah comes along and describes. So why is it so important for it to be fastened on Aaron's chest? Because because this way he will have the names of the sons of Israel. All the names of all the tribes will be upon his heart. So Aaron will know at all times that when he prays from his heart, who is he praying for? The entirety of the nation. He's not here to pray for Levi. Pray for Levi. He's not here to pray for Torah scholars. He's not here to pray for the military. He prays for all the Jewish people. And he has a constant reminder of all the names, of all the tribes, in their various colors and iterations, in the various forms, with their various expressions. 
And then the first base on Migdash, it was purely ornamental. Well, well, that's what we're kind of seeing or understanding here. But the question is, why is Rashi telling this to us? And the thing is this. Something's off with the verses. Where the verses go and describe the details of the Choshen, how it should be fastened, why it should be fastened, and then we have verse 30. Oh, by the way, by the way, that Choshen that we just talked about and described in, in its completion, the Choshen we told you exactly where it should be, how it should be worn, when it must be, uh, that thing. Oh, by the way, make sure before you fasten it, make sure in the folds you place that Urim Vitumen. Shouldn't that have been earlier? Shouldn't we hear about the Choshen in its entirety, with all of its materials, finished, completed, and then you can fasten it. We're kind of, we're getting dressed a little prematurely here. Make the Choshen, finish making it, finish fashioning it. When it's a completed item, then you'll fasten it. Then you will wear it. That's the puzzle, that's the question that arises from the cascading verses here. The last verse seems to be out of place. It, it, it appears as an addendum when actually it should have been prior to verse 29, before we describe how you'll wear and what you'll do with the Choshen. To answer this very unspoken question, Rashi tells us that the Choshen has two different personas. The Choshen is Atzmo, the Choshen itself is a Beged. It's an accessory. It's a wardrobe accessory. That's what it is. There are Shmone Begadim, there are eight raiments. That's one of the eight raiments. Whether it functions or doesn't function as a communication device doesn't take away from the fact that it is a portion of the wardrobe. It needs to be there. Heim Einam Chelek built in Nifredimenu. But the Urim Vatumim are not an inseparable part of it insofar as accessory is concerned. If the Choshen was missing gemstones, then it's not an accessory. If the gemstones were there, but the names of the tribes are not inscribed, it's not able to serve its ornamental purposes. However, if the Choshen doesn't have a parchment in its folds, it can serve its ornamental purposes. What can't it do? It can't do its secondary purpose, its secondary the, the mission. What's the secondary purpose? Communication. To communicate. Yeah. What, what? So the Choshen is actually both then. It's regard to the second purpose of the Choshen, that the Urim Vatumim serve as an inseparable part of the Choshen. The Urim Vatumim are inseparable insofar as the Choshen's communications persona is concerned. But as far as its accessories persona is concerned, the Urim Vatumim actually add nothing. They weren't seen. They didn't change the way it appeared on a regular basis. And it wasn't even a part of it. Why was, was the primary, the why was the primary purpose ornamental? What was the primary purpose? Why was it ornamental? Why was it ornamental? Yeah, because you're saying the primary pur purpose was ornamental. The secondary purpose was because, communication. I'll tell you why. Because in the second base of Migdash, they were still a base of Migdash. They still did everything they had to do. And Aaron would still look down, or the Kohen God would still look down at his breastplate and see the names of all the tribes, representing all the colors of the Jewish people. Forget colors of Benetton. The colors of Israel. I think what Mark is asking though is why even have a Choshen but for the fact that it's there to communicate and the answer Hashem. and the answer is that the Choshen serves to remind Aharon that he's there to represent the entire nation That's not and, and, and like I said I, I didn't say colors of, of Israel lightly gemstones every yid is a diamond a different kind of diamond some yidin sign one way, some yidin shine another way. But he has to know, Aaron's reminded constantly, every yid's a diamond, and every yid is a different color. There's onyx, and there's carbuncle, and there's diamond, and there's ruby, there's all kinds. <laughs> They're all precious, and they're many different colors. And if Aaron forgets this for one moment, or it moves from his heart, he's not a coin gadol, and the Beis Hamikdash can't function as the Beis Hamikdash. Because it has to be the place where the coin gadol is representing every single member of Am Yisrael. And if, he, and if he personalizes things or thinks about his own family or own tribe or her own friends, then we miss the point. That's a very important thing. Now besides this, we were fortunate enough to be able to communicate with God. But that's not part of Beis HaMikdash per se. Beis HaMikdash is the place, like Rambam says, where we can do our service. We have many, many mitzvahs to do. Karbanot and offerings and uh, many things to do. What do you need to do these, these things? A base of Migdash. What if the Shekhinah won't be in the base of Migdash in an overt way? Guess what? It wasn't in the second base of Migdash. It still functioned. So what if we didn't feel the presence of God? So what if we didn't see the presence of God? Still go, still do you think? 
And that is the purpose that's actually being conveyed to us. Rashi says, yes, there is a secondary purpose. This explains why it only comes in verse 30 after hearing about the Choshen and the purpose of the Choshen. Because at first we hear about the Choshen as big day kahuna, as a wardrobe accessory. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. It's a, it's a very important thing. big day If the Kohen has no garments, he has no, he's no kahuna. The thing that animates or activates his kahuna is his garments. So he needs to have a Choshen. Or he's not a Kohen Gadol. Mm-hmm. But conversely, the Torah now adds to us that this garment that the Kohen Gadol wore, because he represented the Jewish people, and because the base of Migdal is such a holy place, and because the is there, it was able to serve in a secondary function as a communications device. But that was only because the battery was in it. That was based on the Ksav. Mm-hmm.